Hello and welcome to this webinar on Japan-UK cooperation in international economy and trade. My name is Mary schneider petzinger I'm a senior research fellow here at Chatham House and direct the Global Trade Policy Forum as well. I'm really delighted to be welcoming you to this webinar that's going to explore how the trade relationship between Japan and the UK can be strengthened further. We're going to look at the economic and the strategic rationale for doing so, also for the implications, not only for the bilateral relationship, but also broader engagement with the Indo-Pacific region. And I'm doubly excited to be sharing this event today because it's part of a series of four webinars held in partnership with Japan House London. I'll turn it over to Michael Hulihan, the Director General of Japan House, for his welcome remarks in just a second. But let me just say that this event is taking place on the record. And after we've heard from our speakers, you'll have plenty of opportunities to join the discussion and submit questions throughout the event by using the Q&A functions on Zoom. And without further ado, um, Michael, let me turn it over to you to, to welcome our participants. Okay, thank you, Marianne. So <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, good morning, and probably good evening as well to everyone. For, thank you for joining this session. Um, for anyone who doesn't know about Japan House, um, it's located on Kensington High Street in central London. Um, it's arranged across three floors and it prevents visitors with the opportunity to discover, to learn about and to engage with Japan. It offers a pretty varied range of authentic cultural experiences such as exhibitions, events, workshops. There's also a library, a shop, travel advice and gastronomy. And it seeks to build a bridge of deeper understanding and to create an enduring legacy of relationships between the UK and Japan based upon cultural understanding. As we see today, um, Japan House is also a forum for the exchange of ideas, new developments and conversations between the two nations across actually a very wide range of topics. Um, and the Chatham House series, the two series have so far covered things such as the aging society, climate change, security, COVID, and last time it was uh, cultural diplomacy. In addition to our physical presence in London, over the last 18 months, we have accelerated the creation of what is probably best described as Japan House Online. This is a digital presence that replicates a virtual version of the physical site. We've created live events and activities which have ranged across manga and craft workshops through to live sake brewery tours, through to 3D virtual exhibition tours and masterclasses in kitchen skills, as well as the development of an online shop. So please, if you can't visit us, do check out our website for all of these ongoing events. Our latest exhibition, probably the uniquely titled Windowology, Architectural Views from Japan, um, examines how windows influence our perspectives on the environment, contemporary urban living, craftsmanship, design, architecture, and even print literature. Personally, I actually find it quite intriguing to see how the significance of something as simple and often taken for granted as a window has culturally specific meanings and uses in different cultures. Even in an economically and technologically globalized world, culture has the power to define our view of the outside world. International business relations are probably no different in that respect and will be influenced by a lot of uncontrollable factors such as history, politics, economics, technological, legal, the environmental and the social. And in this context, social embraces the cultural variations which distinguish one market from another. These cultural variations can be quite complex, touching upon national culture, ethnic culture, industrial culture, company culture, and of course, individual behavior. So in the context of a post-colonial world, and culturally diverse multilateral trading partnerships, such as the CPTPP, empathy towards expressions of culture will be important in achieving successful trading relationships. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more uh, in this morning's discussion. So Marianne, if I can hand back to you and we'll get into the meat of the session. 
Thank you so much, Michael, for setting the scene of, this, of what Japan House does um, in the physical, but also in the virtual world. And really delighted that Chatham House has this opportunity to partner with you on such an issue, such as economics and trade. It really is not just about economics and trade anymore, but really gets into many of the other issues that you touched upon, whether it's broader issues of society, technology, sustainability. And I'm sure we will talk about this in the session as well. But to start, um, let me introduce our two speakers. I'm really delighted to be joined by Mineka Morita Yeager. She's a senior research fellow in international trade at the University of Sussex and a policy research fellow at the UK Trade Policy Observatory. And I'm also delighted that Christopher Dent is with us. He's a professor in economics and international business at Edgehill University. I'm sorry to keep the introduction so brief, but we unfortunately only have one hour and we really wanna hear from you both, Monica and um, Christopher. So Monica, let me um, start with you. In, in 2020, the UK and Japan agreed the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Last year, the UK started the application process to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. I'm sure we'll hear a lot. Um, about CPTPP today, this trade block of 11 countries that includes Japan. So can you just um, give us a bit of the background of where we stand with regards to the bilateral relationship um, and also the strategic and the economic benefits of the UK joining CPTPP, ideally from the perspective of the UK and Japan. So Mirako, over to you, please, for your opening remarks. Sorry, we can't hear you. If you could please unmute yourself. Yeah. Fantastic. So, can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, deep apology that I couldn't join on time. Somehow that this is the first experience where the Zoom doesn't like me when it is needed. <laughs> so, well, but I'm so pleased that I can be here with you. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. So let me just uh, quickly um, talk about a historical background and then the evolution of CPTPP. What it's uh, the CPTPP from the UK's perspective as well as Japan's perspective and the more broader issue of the challenge uh, and then also challenge ahead for the UK and then sort of the collaboration between the UK and Japan for the 21st century trade and the world economy. So to, to start with um, uh, the TPP, which is the former form of a CPTPP was led by the Obama administration for enhancing its pivot in Asia to counterbalance the growing economic and political influence of China in the region. So its ambition included not only strengthening economic relation with its Asian trade partners, but enhancing security lies with the region. So the US led drafting the text in order to promote market oriented trade and reflect the US in interest in rulemaking. So this is an important fact, especially when it comes to China's accession to the CPTPP, but not for today's discussion. And uh, after the tr Trump administration withdrew the US from the agreement in 2017, Japan vigorously made efforts to revive the agreement as a TPP minus one, which is current TPPP. So there was a speculation or strong hope that the US would come back to the CPTPP or the TPP. So, but the Biden administration's, the US first approach faded away that hope of the US return within the foreseeable future. So then it comes to the UK joining the CPTPP. So currently the CPTPP is a regional like-minded middle power club, <laughs> very long, that promotes free trade. So UK's joining the CPTPP will make the club beyond regional and open the Horizon to be global. And the CPTPP is likely to be extended further in the future. Already China and Taiwan and, uh, made an application to join the CPTPP. And then China's application triggered South Korea to start preparing its application to fly. So that I expect that rapidly, you know, changing geopolitical dynamics would continuously reshape the CPTPP. I just would like to, you know, bear in mind that aspect in terms of the UK and Japan's collaboration and the international economy and trade. So the 
what what is the the UK the CPTPP is joining CPTPP for the UK? So for the UK, joining the CPTPP is a part of its historical geostrategic project. So what is called the Indo-Pacific tilt, um, that is a shift from its focus from Europe to the Asia Pacific region. The UK government framed the Indo-Pacific tilt as three pillars, economic opportunities, geopolitical security, and sharing core values, such as free trade and democracy. The UK wants to use the CPTPP as a basis for you know, increasing its political presence in the Asia Pacific region and using the region's economic dynamism for its economic growth. On the South Face, the tilt from Europe to the Indo-Pacific and using CPTPP create, um, creating the economic opportunity has a strong rationale. Since the region is the world's engine of growth, expected to generate 56% of global um, gr growth between 2019 and 2015. Uh, um, Brexit will reduce UK total export imports by 15% relative to not leaving the EU, according to the Office of Budget Responsibilities calculation. So the UK needs market recoup trade losses to the EU incurred by Brexit. However, potential economic gains from joining the CPTPP will be um, below the expectation. So this is mainly because the UK is already benefiting from preferential trade arrangements under its bilateral FTAs with seven countries, seven CPTP countries. Uh, these are Canada, Chile, Japan, Mexico, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam out of 11. And, um, and in addition, the UK has signed the FTA with Australia last December. The FTA with New Zealand is expected to follow. So Malaysia and Brunei are likely to be only two countries that have no FTA relation with the UK when the UK joined the CPTPP. But these two countries have not yet ratified the CPTPP. And UK's trade relation with these countries account for most of UK's trade with the CPTPP countries, both in terms of exports and imports. So among the CPTPP member countries, UK's major partners are Canada, Japan, Australia, and Singapore. So these countries are already covered but, um, under the bilateral FTAs. Um, the, so it's true that main benefits of using, you know, benefit of UK's joining the CPTPP is, you know, that it offers unified rules that apply to all members. So this is a great advantage for business. Um, for example, the CPTPP's rule of origin arrangement is very generous as it follows for the full accumulation in inputs from the CPTPP partner countries. However, the evidence shows geographical proximity matter for trade, both in goods and services. So this is a reality. So even the US expectation for economic opportunities is so high given that the UK already has bilateral FTA relation with it, most of the CPTPP countries, economic benefits is limited. So the value of UK's joining the CPTPP for the UK is more about geopolitical strategies in the wider foreign policy context. So then, then what, what is the challenges for the UK? Um, so the, from the trade policy you know, expert perspective, so UK's joining the CPTPP can be seen as a symbolic strategic move away from the EU's regulatory model. The main challenge for the UK to join the CPTPP was the social potential social impact of such a strategic choice at the domestic level. Um, so that, as I explained before, um, maybe the, the UK, maybe that, um, First of all, yes, I have to explain. The UK has accepted all CPTP rules to join the club, but it is difficult for the UK to take all of the Asia Pacific style, um, you know, market red regulatory regime, because it's a, just a way, you know, still in there within the EU's regulatory regime, and it has just departed. So one example is uh, digital trade. 
the free cross border data flow with the CPTPP member countries and that the CPTPP rules would serve innovation and create new business opportunity for sure. But how to ensure policy and operation mechanism to maintain the UK's high standard data, pro data privacy protection based on GDPR while ensuring free cross data flow in the region is still uncertain. So, and then the, we have to say that uh, I have to know that the CPTP members have different levels of domestic data privacy law, reflecting the level of development and the different social norms and culture. So that means that, that that will be the two major challenges in this context. One is the influence of the EU's adequacy decision to the UK. So that, that adequacy decision had a four year sunset so that the UK might reassess its decision. And then also relating to this among the CPTP countries, the only Canada, Japan, New Zealand have received adequacy decision from the EU. And also the non-business stakeholders in the UK such as British consumer organization express a strong concern how the British citizen data privacy is ensured in the CBTPP countries. And another example is how to maintain current level of protection in food and standard safety. But I will leave this issue when it, you know we elaborate the discussion later. And uh, so the next two topic is what, what is the CPTPP and especially UK's joint CPTPP for Japan. So since the UK, uh, sorry, since the US withdrew from the TPP. Japan vigorously initiated to conclude the TPP minus one. I observe the two rationales behind. So the first one is the CPTPP as a forum of rule setter. Japan used to be a strong supporter of the multilateral trading system over for decades until the WTO became multifunction and its existence has been threatened from the early 2000s. So through the GATT system to the WTO system, Japan can shift its position from a rule taker to rule maker. So Japan needed an international forum that can support the rules-based trading system and promote free trade in order to achieve its political and economic interests in global trade. So Japan expect the CPTP's potential power to set in the rule for international trade. Second, the CPTP was politically in um, important for Japan from the geopolitical strategic perspective. Um, having been exposed to economic and then political challenges posed by China, that's a 21st century superpower that stands on state-led economy and is uh, located just next door. It is very important for Japan to ensure rules-based market-oriented trade environment in that regard. So the for, from all of these, the UK, the country which has been a front runner of free trade, market economy, and democracy, is exactly the right partner and the right country to be a new member of the TCPTPP for Japan. This is, this is why Japan has been endorsing UK's joining CPTPP. So having said that, well, I do not think that accession process goes straightforward as all you know trade negotiation is a, as always a case so as i said well the cptpp accession rules clearly sets compliance with all of the existing rules as a condition so japan emphasized every occasion of the you know using every occasion its position that is um, that you know the uk has to comply with all of the existing rules in the cptpp without exception so so as I explained, uh, maintaining the high level rule is necessary to make the CPTPP as a global club of free trade and market economy. Since the UK is the first acceding country to the CPTPP and the country is well established open economy and it is going to be the second largest economy once it joins the CPTPP, so Japan expects the UK join the club without any derogation from the rule. Whether you know, keeping high standard. So then um, this, you know, Japan position is further strengthened by China's application to 
join the CPTPP. And, um, you know, if the CPTPP member allow political accommodations, such as using side letters, um, the full derogation from the legal requirement for the UK, would trigger a race to vote on for future accession. And the high standard CPTPP rule may lose substance, like RCEP, which is, you know, shallow, shallower, you know, FTA in the Asia Pacific, uh, which includes China. So on the other hand, well, Japan expects the UK to be the first member of the club as scheduled, you know, like in by 2022. Um, so because of China's willingness to join the club, Japan wants to strengthen the CPTPP as a club of market economy involving the UK. So this is a sort of the political dilemma as far as I understand. Great. Um, Miko, you've really set out a broad range of issues right. and I'm sure we'll get back to during the discussion. I have right. a number yes. of Sorry. questions for you yeah. as well. I'm happy to. But there is one key to. point I think that you highlighted towards the end here, which is that if the UK's joining of CPTP goes ahead, the Japan um, and UK together would be the two largest economies and absolutely, you know, for kind of perhaps a future renegotiation of CPTPP mm -hmm. and just looking towards the future in terms of what it actually presents for opportunities for the UK and for Japan together to cooperate yeah. and drive forward um, mm -hmm. CPTPP and to ensure to set the rules for 21st century trade that um, perhaps again, that leads us to think a bit about the broader context of this um, UK-Japan cooperation and also ensuring again, 21st century trade issues, whether it's sustainability, whether it's digital trade flows yeah. are covered. Um, so Christopher, having that um, kind of under our belt, what do you think are the key issues again for the UK and for Japan to look at going forward? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and it's great to connect with you all today. Um, uh, I think Monaco gave a very good overview of where we're at with the C. PTPP at the moment. And just before I kind of get into uh, the kind of broader issues relating to uh, the, the Japan-Britain uh, relationship, <clears throat> key thing to remember about the CPTPP is that it's one, it's a story of evolution because it started, its actual kind of original historic route was a bilateral between FTA, between Singapore and New Zealand, which then evolved into a quadrilateral and then the TPP and now the CPTPP. It's a question of what the uh, this agreement will become in the future. And that's the second thing I'd like to focus on in my talk. Now, um, of course, you know, Menaka made a very good point about how Britain already has a number of FTA links with the CPTPP members and will those links will grow as the, uh, the Australian and uh, New Zealand FTAs are, are put in place. But it does depend, of course, on what type of FTAs Britain has already signed with other CPTPP members. And if you look at the, uh, the recently um, concluded negotiations between the UK and Australia, uh, their FTA uh, uh, agreement, which could be ratified later this year, uh, domestic political events in the UK depending. But as we know, the, the UK-Japan deal was more or less based verbatim on the previously brokered uh, EU-Japan trade agreements. And there are many as aspects of that particular FTA, which is still based on the EU regulatory model. You know, for example, if you look at the chapter on trade and sustainable development, it's more or less the same as the one that the EU has with Japan. Uh, if you look at the UK-Australia FTA though, it's quite closely based on the CPTPP and therefore has been shaped by strong US regulatory influence. And indeed, if you compare the texts of the UK Australia FTA, many of its chapters are strikingly similar in text content terms to the recently uh, renegotiated or negotiated uh, US Mexico Canada agreement, the UM, 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 sorry, USMCA that superseded NAFTA in 2018. So, thus, the current kind of UK Japan CEP, Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, does not provide a stronger platform for them to shape the future development of the CPTPP uh, than compared to say the Australia-UK agreement. But that doesn't mean to say that Japan and the UK cannot work closely together in the Asia-Indo-Pacific uh, and beyond going forward. 
And I would argue that there's a very strong case for both the UK and Japan being considered firm natural partners in a multi-sector context. So firstly, they have many similar things in common, and this includes their relative positions <clears throat> in their respective regional contexts. So both are large island nations and economies lying just off their regional continents, uh, the relationships with which has been somewhat ambiguous over years and decades, the UK caught between its European and Atlantic orientations and identities, Japan between its Asian and Pacific ones. So both nations understand the balancing and management of various kinds of tensions that this can evolve. Secondly, uh, Japan would welcome Britain's engagement in the uh, Asia Indo-Pacific region as a fellow influential middle power to counterbalance China and scope exists for closer Japan-UK uh, defense cooperation. In fact, in February last year, both nations affirmed this in a high level defense and foreign ministers meeting. Japan also has a uh, longstanding experience of working with other Anglosphere countries with similar normative values, Australia, New Zealand, United States and Canada. And Britain itself also has strong and broad ties in the Asia Indo-Pacific, arguably more than any other European nation. And aside from Europe, the region is strategically the most important to global Britain, and its partnership with Japan will be instrumental in the future development of the UK's engagement with the Asia Indo-Pacific for reasons explained here, and we can discuss later. Thirdly, despite their geographic distance, uh, Japan and Britain have a strong bandwidth of ties between them, not just in trade, finance, and foreign direct investment, but also as Michael alluded to earlier, in education, science, technology, energy, popular culture, civil society, and uh, many other areas. Uh, so for example, um, British uh, fashion designer, Paul Smith is huge in Japan with over 400 uh, stores there. Most of his stores are actually in Japan. Um, also my younger son, Joel, works for London-based graphic artist who last month directed new TV adverts for the Japanese department store chain Parker. There's very broad ties between both countries. And in terms of international institutions, both countries have long-standing partnerships as fellow G7, G20, OECD members, and work across a, a wide range of other multilateral arrangements, the World Trade Organization, World Bank, IMF, United Nations and its various sub-agencies, such as the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Fourthly, and just as importantly, both the Japanese and British are very particular indeed about their tea. So in sum, uh, Britain has some key, sorry, Britain and Japan have some key things and interests in common, as well as existing strong foundations for, and frameworks of partnership on which an even stronger partnership can be developed. Britain's accession to the CPTPP would significantly contribute to that process, depending, of course, on how effective and uh, impactful the agreement becomes. Uh, we can talk about CPTPP's further expanded membership and its competition with RCEP later if there's interest in doing so. We can also discuss how, notwithstanding their natural partnership between Japan and the UK, uh, the Britain, British government also must take into account, of course, ongoing tense relations in Northeast Asia between Japan, China, and the and both Koreas. But perhaps the main point I'd like to get across to you though today is uh, in this brief presentation, concerns key future developments emerging now that could increasingly shape the future of the Japan-UK relationship and the future of trade itself in the Asia Indo-Pacific and globally. I want to talk about three key areas. And the first relates to the trade climate action agenda. Now, both J the Japanese and British governments have announced their own carbon net zero plans. And the UK has even taken inspiration from Japan in devising an industrial strategy plan to achieve it. First real time it's done that for some considerable time. The trade now represents about 60% of world GDP. If you go back to the 1970s, it was 30%. 1990s, it was 40%. So trade is going to play a, a major role in helping decarbonize the global economy, potentially. And there are various climate-related trade policies and issues that we can discuss that are emerging and becoming quite important, including the application of carbon pricing 
uh, to internationally traded goods, as is currently being planned by the EU under its carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, the CBAM, uh, which looks to be initially installed from the uh, next year in 2023 and fully operational by 2026. And that could be a game changer. And the UK has plans to introduce its own such mechanism. Uh, and just a few months ago in October, it launched its own feasibility study into establishing its this uh, trade climate policy. Now, early in 2021, Japan has also announced it was considering doing the same, as is the United States, Canada's and other. In addition, climate uh, goods and service industries are growing very fast and are set to expand progressively as climate change pressures mount. And this looks set to become a dominant future sector for Japan, UK trade and investment. And the broadband industrial science and technology links between both countries and their companies provides a firm foundation for this development. The second key emerging area affecting the future of, of global trade is how fourth industrial revolution technologies may shape future trade. So digital trade, we've been talking about already, has received growing attention in recent years and now is an emerging area of trade diplomacy. However, it gets a bare mention in the UK-Japan Closer Economic Partnership Agreement. The word digital only mentioned seven times uh, in that agreement. If you can compare that to the UK, Australia FTA has a whole chapter, digital trade, and it's mentioned uh, digital trade 174 times across the whole agreement. And guess what? This uh, agreement, though, this chapter on digital trade is partly derived from and modeled on the US MCA. And there was important uh, new work that Japan and, and the UK could develop here. Uh, digital trade is going to play a vitally important role in shaping both economies and their trade relationship generally going forward. Another issue with the fourth industrial revolution is the potentially huge impact that 3D printing and additive manufacturing could have on future supply chain trade. This could be a, another potential game-changing development, depending on the progress and distribution of technology. And both Britain and Japan have a, a kind of quite, possess quite considerable capacity and interest on this front. And again, this is another area of promising opportunities for them to work forward as, as uh, innovative trade policy makers. The third last, uh, uh, last area I'd like to talk about is about the future of uh, Japan-UK relations and the, and the Asia-Indo-Pacific uh, region itself, and how this will critically shape the global system as well as how we address global challenges facing all humanity in the 21st century. So when you're looking at the region itself, it's all too tempting still to adopt a neo-realist approach and focus on great game rivalry and geopolitical competition uh, among the major powers. And this of course is important at this, but at the same time, um, the Asia Indo-Pacific's impact on the global community is expected to grow and with it, its global responsibilities. And I'd like to see that both Japan and Britain has relatively strong, have been relatively strong supporters of global multilateralism as institutions. While not great powers, they do exercise influence and as partners can help foster a stronger multilateral approach within the region to tackling major uh, challenges, global challenges like climate change. This though is gonna be a big ask and will depend on their alliance building skills uh, and developing alliances with like-minded nations and, and governments within the region. So thank you very much indeed uh, for your time and I look forward to your questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions, but perhaps since both of you mentioned RCEP, let's start with that. Um, since I guess it fits very well into the context of regional integration on the one hand, but also I mean, to come back to your earlier remarks about for the UK perspective, this is really about the geopolitical strategic um, rationale rather than the economic rationale. Because if you're just looking at the economic case in terms of GDP, in terms of trade, RCEP would arguably play a larger role than CPTPP because it makes up about 30% um, of um, global trade. So to what extent do you think that, again, for the UK and for Japan, focusing on CPTPP really is the right way forward? Um, Mineko, let's start with you and then Christopher, if you have any thoughts to add on RCEP versus CPTPP. Thank you very much, Marian, for the very thoughtful uh, question. Um, I would like to just emphasize, you know, the importance 
of the, you know, a middle power alliance that share values of the 21st century and the world economy. It's uh, really the, the key for the UK and Japan. Um, so that, you know, that it, I do believe the UK will become the first new member of the CPTPP. And then on the UK, if once the UK joined the club, the CPTPP, in addition to UK, Japan, SEPA, it becomes a solid foundation for the two countries to enhance rules-based global trading system beyond the bilateral and the plurilateral levels. So the middle power strategic alliance with common values within the CPTPP member countries, also the core will be the UK, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So that was very important than ever for several reasons. So this is something that the ASEP cannot achieve. And then uh, for that, you know, the, the three major reasons, you know, uh, the, maybe that I overlap what uh, Chris already mentioned because it's very comprehensive. But uh, the first, I think the three major reasons for the importance of uh, this alliance through the CPTPP, also the Japan UK SEPA, is the first, it's a post war global economic order has shaped relationship between the United States and Asia and underpinned the prosperity and the security of Asia. But the hegemonic battles between the US and China, as you know, at, uh, is putting the prosperity in the region under strain. So, and then, so we, we need something for that to just the uh, middle power, just collaborate together. And the second, we cannot uh, expect U US leadership in especially global trading system. So for coming years, so while that WTO reforms are going on, for example, the countries continue to use FTAs to respond to the dynamic political economic changes around international trade environment. So because the UK and Japan shares interest in the WTO reforms on the one hand and having bilateral and bilateral alliance on the other hand, that, that means once the UK joins the WTP, so the two countries can fill a gap to shape 21st century global trading system by forming middle power strategic alliance. The third is about collaboration for promoting common values as uh, Chris just uh, explained. I think you know that human rights environment protection becomes a very core part of the international trade policy, so especially promoting climate change and the sustainable development in its socio-economic system is the key for 21st century trading system. So that you can Japan, Japanese companies can collaborate with business opportunities arising from sustainable development goals, such as energy efficiencies and green energy and eco-friendly products and services. And then this is really area that both two governments can facilitate strategic business alliance. So I just stop here. Great. Christopher, what do you make of that? Yeah, but, uh, th those are fantastic points Monarch has made. And, and just to kind of add on to what she just said, I think the key thing for me is in terms of trade policy rules and regulations, I think the CPTPP has an advantage there. But for me, the key issue is the trade agenda is how that is evolving and shaping in the 21st century. So it's not necessarily about conventional customs rules and rules of origin. Um, I'm not sure which one of the two regional agreements will be more impactful there, but the key thing is, is, is how each, each agreement shapes the future of the global trade agenda. And to me, actually, our SEP may be better positioned to do that because it seems more of a, a broader economic partnership than the CPTPP does because it covers more development related issues, more SDG related issues, for example. It also is much more uh, large <laughs> in terms of GDP terms, has more powerful players at the moment. So for me, RCEP is actually better positioned to shape the global trade agenda than CPTPP is at the moment. And that to me is the key issue. Fascinating. Yes. One of the key questions is also to what extent um, the UK has to simply accept the terms of CPTPP or to what extent there is room for renegotiating or for carve outs. And um, you know, there's the kind of legal questions around that, but coming back to the geopolitical implications, you know, do you think that for the current members of the CPTPP, they're perhaps less inclined to grant any carve outs in light of China's potential accession to, to T CPTPP? And um, I guess let me bring in one of the questions here as well from the audience that's asking, 
what will be China's geopolitical interest as it has applied to join the CPTPP. Minako, any thoughts from you on that? Yeah, well, the China, well, of course, for well, the UK is a we thought of the first of the rule changer of the CPTPP, and then China came. But actually, let me just say, you know, why why did China express the you know um, the wish to join the CPTPP is very much a uh, political, you know, geopolitical strategy. And, um, according to the you know the uh, media, that it seems like a Taiwan followed China, but actually Taiwan has been you know preparing for access into the CPTPP TPPP, and then actually uh, domestically ready to go. And the CPTPP members already understand it, that Taiwan can just, you know, satisfy all the rules and then and they're ready. But the, um, when it comes to China's influence in CPTPP, I, I think this is why that I said, well, the historical background of CPTPP. And uh, I don't know how the, the kind of the whether the China, when it comes to, to the, the membership, whether it will be the application start or not, it is very political and then it never, you know, unprecedented. So they, even though the CPTPP has a rule for the accession, this is China's accession is more kind of the polit political domain. And but the important thing is, as I said, this is CPTPP is uh, drafted mostly by the US interest. That, that reflects the you know, market-led economy. And it will be really hard, is I'm not sure that, you, that China is uh, seriously thinking about whether uh, the China is happy to abide by this market-led reg uh, regulatory you know, regime under the CPTPP. So th this is a, you know, the, in the technical question, but this is substantial, also the substantial question, whether China can respond to it. Um, so just to finish this one, and I will just respond if Christopher has further thought. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, the, the CPTPP is is more or less you know a, a US regulatory agreement. If you look at the similarity of text between, say, the, the CPTPP and the USMCA, and if you look at the, the state-owned enterprise chapter, which is going to be vital for China, there is a verbatim match between the two chapters. Um, for me, I think as well, if the Americans join, <clears throat> they'll want to rename it. Uh, they, I can't see the Democrats or the, or the Republicans going for rejoining an agreement, which is now a little bit old from their point of view. Uh, and I think they would want to actually uh, rename it. Now, of course, if, if China joins before the US, they have the potential influence to block the US from joining. I mean, that, that could actually happen, potentially. I'm not too sure if it would, or whether it'd be in China's interest uh, to do that. But it goes back to my other key point. I mean, this is an evolving agreement and the name could evolve depending on who joins. If the Americans join, they'll, they'll certainly want political, domestic political reasons that will need to be re renamed. Indo-Pacific uh, partnership agreement, something along those lines. Um, so there's a, a lot of things out there to play. There's a lot of, a lot of geopolitical dynamics here. I'll, I'll leave it now so we've got more time for questions. And there's lots of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, Christopher, in your presentation, you mentioned digital trade, and there was one comment um, also in the Q&A um, by one of the participants on, on digital trade. And looking back, I think 2019, the G20 Osaka um, summit kind of came out with the data free flow with trust um, notion. And obviously last year with the G7 presidency of the UK, there was also a lot of focus on digital. So to what extent do you see Japan and the UK really driving forward digital trade? And you know, how can some of those principles that have now been agreed be actually put into practice? Um, Christopher, first yeah. you, and then uh, Mineko, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, so at the moment, the CPTPP doesn't have a digital trade chapter. It, it does have some coverage on digital trade. It mentions the word digital, I think 27 times in the agreement. Um, the UK has last month signed a digital economy agreement with, with Singapore, which apparently is the most ambitious such digital trade agreement that has been signed. Uh, the UK has got some interesting kind of competences and industrial capabilities on, on digital trade. It's got a huge finance sector which lends itself to digital trade. It's got a number of professional service industries which are quite strong again lends themselves to digital trade so from a service trade point of view britain's quite well uh, positioned 
I mean, it's one of the key new emerging areas of, of, of uh, trade policy. And, and it, it will certainly be, I think, up for negotiation when the CP, TPP is, is revised, reviewed, or, or reformulated into something else. So that's all I'll say for, for now on that. Fantastic. Nina, cool, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I completely agree with Chris. If I just add, well, there's several points, or there's maybe three points to add. So that, that you know, that looking at the UK, Japan, SIPA, going back, and then that digital trade agreement is something that's, well, UK, Japan, SIPA is a sort of mostly copy and paste of the EU, Japan, EPA, but digital trade um, chapter is a new the chapter where the, which the UK just made. And then this is a, the UK use it as a stepping stone of further, you know, moving toward more the Asia Pacific style digital trade governance. And that's a result I, we can see from the UK Singapore digital trade agreement. And then also the currently uh, that recently signed the UK Australia um, FTA which is mostly the copy or more some part of beyond the, what Australia agree with the Singapore with its digital trade agreement. So that the UK is maybe in that sense already uh, go farther from Japan from that, you know, the promoting the digital trade agreement with the alliance. But the, let me just discuss what we can, they, that these the two countries can do in this area. And so one is I'd like to say that, that both countries have high standard or regulatory standard. And they, then to just uh, promoting a good regulatory practice of digital trade among you know, trade partners is very important. So that rather than you know, um, derogating from the, the current high standard or the lowering the standard for others, they really have to help others may improve the regulatory governance in the digital trade. And the other thing is, as I said, well, that, you know, a British citizens have the high con um, uh, have concern on the data privacy. And then also the, um, um, you know, trade policy, this kind of UK's journey, policy journey shows that, um, that in the agreement, they are, narrowing the scope of the uh, policy capacity which to safeguard the public policy objectives in its you know latest uh, digital trade agreement so that is it right direction or not this kind of thing that because the uk is real rapidly you know in, in concluding many ftas and then this agreement and so on that not enough discussion takes place at the domestic level and then same as japan and that not so many, you know, that still uh, public cannot understand civil society. They don't understand what's going on. So the, the important things I'd like to emphasize here is trust, as you said, you know, the trust is a key for the further innovation of business. So the Japan and the UK has to have a kind of open discussion or inclusive dialogue, including all stakeholders and open the information and then discuss the, at the you know the um, more inclusive level, not only the policymakers level. That's my recommendation. Thank you. Right, and there's lots of other issues that I want to get into around supply chain security. But um, let us just pause there on some of the questions that are still coming in with regards to RCEP and CPTPP. So I'm going to bundle them just because um, we are running out of time. So one question is about the link between CPTPP and RCEP, and the other one around AUKUS. I meant to what extent AUKUS plays a role in augmenting the UK's trade strategy and involvement in RCEP. Um, Christopher, perhaps starting yeah. with you and then Minako. Yes, thank you. I, I take the, uh, the, the second question, I think comes from my, my old friend, Claire. Uh, so the, yeah, the, <laughs> the agreement that the UK has signed with, with Australia, as I mentioned in the beginning, it has striking similarities with, if you look at the, some of the end chapters, the more kind of, uh, kind of uh, functional cooperation chapters, like on environment, labor, small, medium-sized enterprises, state-owned enterprises, uh, trade and women environment and empowerment. Um, many of these are, are very close match with either the CPTPP or the USMCA. 
uh, and it's got quite high level of an kind of regulatory ambition, which of course the, the RCEP at the moment doesn't have the same, that same kind of level. However, I think from a strategic point of view, uh, for RCEP to have another kind of market liberal Anglosphere country like Australia and New Zealand, that does substantially increase the, that constituency, uh, that you know, coalition within RCEP. And the UK has got, you know, it's a middle power, but with some influence, right? Various kind of, you know, both, you know soft power influence. And, uh, and I, it could make quite a big difference if, if it joined the RCEP. Um, but I, I'm not too sure if that is going to be a bit of an overreach, really. I mean, the, the current government in the UK, uh, just to give you some background context, it's, it's had to kind of uh, negotiate very quickly a number of transition deals, you know, which we used to have under EU membership with, with a number of, you know, 70 other countries around the world. And that's left them a little bit stretched. So I, I'm one of the specialist advisors to the House of Commons International Trade Select Committee, and we've been waiting ages for the, the UK government to negotiate this, this agreement with, with Australia, it's been delayed. I, it, it is a question of how much kind of uh, capacity the UK has to negotiate, um, not just uh, free trade agreements, but quite complex ones involving quite a complex negotiation process. Um, but I, I think it is important from a long-term point of view in terms of the, the UK's relationship, potential relationship with RCEP. I think the UK Australia one is, is quite, could be quite an important kind of um, uh, platform. So I'll leave time now for Monaco to answer the other part. Anything to add, Monaco? Yeah, thank you. I, I had that. Well, the, I have nothing to add to the Chris, but, but um, maybe slightly different angle. But the, um, now we well, we are very much focusing on the you know FTAs and uh, RCEP and CPTPP or more other. But the, the the one thing is you know a lot. Um, I just. Uh, think so the observing the UK trade policy is towards the 21st century is more um, the role of the international trading system, multilateral trading system. In that sense, well, you know, the CPTPP or SEP or whatever, but the CPTP can become the key policy forum to just to, to, to just reorganize the middle power, you know, like-minded countries, the, you know, uh, alliance, and they make input to the multilateral trading, re, reviving, reforming the multilateral trading system. So in that sense, well, the RCEP in, in comparison to CPTPP again, that CPTP has more capacity in terms of the membership uh, to do that. And uh, this is something more that, you know, the US and Japan, and uh, sorry, UK and Japan have to more, you know, more attention at the multilateral level, the collaboration at multilateral level outside of FDA or that using the CPTPP or SEPA. To wrap up, um, let me just quote a one question that focuses on the major challenges in Asia Pacific relations facing the UK, but also Japan. And I guess related to that, perhaps looking really at the context that you're facing, which is both still, you know, COVID-19, a pandemic, economic recovery, stresses on supply chains ongoing, but also very much the context of US-China strategic competition. And so both the UK and Japan have put a strong emphasis on economic security. Japan has just um, introduced a new economic security minister. Japan is also very much involved with Australia and India for a regional supply chain resilience initiative. The UK is also, again, very much focused on supply chains. Their project, Project Defend, is focused on that. So looking at a kind of concept of supply chain security and strengthening supply chain resilience, what do you think the UK and Japan can do in that space, both bilaterally, but perhaps also with partners? Um, and to come back to Minako, you know, the emphasis of the role that the WTO and the multilateral trading system can play in that. Minako, let's start with you on this last question and then Christopher, over to you for closing remarks. Well, as, as you well, as you explained, Marian, that the Japan is, well, both for the UK and Japan, the uh, economic security is uh, becoming the major issues. And then, well, and not only because of the COVID-19, but well, the more wider geopolitical context. And then 
for that, um, I think it's more more about you know that the, the UK and Japan has more uh, other policy framework to just collaborate that in the extent. And then the important thing is, um, well, the, from the trade policy context, as you know, the many countries well the using the uh, the protective uh, measures, and then also the uh, the China after um, um, sort of China what the uh, in the region supply chain because now they become the um, this uh, uh, relation becomes not a vertical but horizontal supply chain uh, relation between China among the Asia Pacific region. So that the key is in how that 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 um, tackle these issues together with the UK and the Japan in the um, CPTPP. Also, this is also very interesting area. That I stop here. Christopher. <laughs> it's a big question, this one. Um, I'll try to give a simplified answer as possible. I, I mentioned earlier about the, the broadband width of, of, uh, of relations between, you know, economic relations between Japan and China. Sorry, Japan and the UK. I uh, beg your pardon. Um, there's quite a lot of Japanese investment in, in Britain and growing uh, British, British investment in Japan. Um, I, I do think that industrially as well, there's some interesting overlaps between the two in terms of future growth industries of the 21st century. And they're both, I haven't, I haven't got kind of the hard kind of data on this, but you know, a broad knowledge of both economies and how they interact. I, I think that there are there is good potential here for them both to work at, at a kind of supply chain kind of level. Uh, and, some, and to keep track on how, for example, 3D printing could, could revolutionize supply chain um, trade because you when you can produce things on your own with with the technology like 3d you don't need to import from overseas you know it, and with, with with companies increasingly wanting to have uh, increasingly quick response time to consumer demand 3d printing can can help that because you don't have to rely on goods coming from uh, intercontinental distances you know through the Suez Canal whatever um, it yeah, there's some interesting technological changes, I think, which both countries and, and the companies in, in both countries are, are having to keep track of because they could be potentially game changing and, and with their impacts on supply chain trade, as I mentioned earlier. But I, I have we got a lot of faith in both countries to grow that a, a strong uh, and broad economic relationship going forward. That's the last message I'd like to leave you with. No, great. And thank you for finishing on that note. There is a lot of ground that we've covered today and certainly a full agenda for the UK and Japan as they seek to strengthen their economic and trade relationship, not just bilaterally, but certainly in the region of the Indo-Pacific and at the global stage as well. So it was a real pleasure and honor to be sharing this webinar. Sorry for not getting to all of the questions. Thank you for joining us. Um, and special thanks also to Japan House for partnering with Chatham House on this event. But um, yeah, please all join me in, in thanking Minako and Christopher for their really, really insightful remarks. And um, hopefully we'll have you back soon as the developments unfold. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.